Hello, everyone. It's me, Andrew. I'm here in my home in lovely Ligonier, Pennsylvania. Um, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Uh, it's about 85 here, mid 80s. There's a gentle breeze going. The sun is shining. It's a really beautiful day. Uh, it's gorgeous here. Hopefully it is lovely where you are. Um, yeah. So William is at his pottery class. So you get a triple dose of me this this week. I think I don't know when his other class ends, but it might be that Wednesdays are a regular thing. So we'll see. So if you're watching, say hello and maybe where you're from. It's always nice to hear where people are tuning in from. Of course, if you would be so kind to like and share our videos, it definitely helps boost the signal and help get the word out about our small business. So we appreciate uh, when folks do that. I see Amanda's watching. Hi, Amanda. Yeah, so busy, busy today as usual. Um, the different kind of busy. I feel like today was... Uh, you know, there are certain days I call it calendar days where it's just all about kind of trying to fit everything in and trying to adjust everything so that the schedule kind of coalesces and everything kind of fits into the schedule. So we had a, a I had a busy day kind of figuring things out that way. Um, you know, it's just, it's nice. It's kind of nice, but then it's also, it kind of, ratchets up my anxiety when I start thinking about all the stuff that I have to do. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. So it could always be worse. Marianne's watching. Hi, Marianne. Our Canada friends are tuning in. Um, so, yeah, we've been busy with that. Um, if you didn't see last night's live, I did a tutorial on making a stylized kind of wing pendant or earrings. I can, when uh, we go to flip our, uh, the camera around to do the project, I can show you uh, what we made. I started the second one, but I've been dreadful about finishing. So we've been just busy with everything, trying to get everything ready. So anyways, um, I finished one earring. I may take it off and turn it into a pendant. Um, but the prompt for the summer fantasy is make earrings. So I have to, I feel like I have to make another one. It, if I sit down and just buckle down and do it, it won't actually take that long. But, you know, it, it, it gets, uh, you know, a little bit frantic around here sometimes with all the stuff that we have to do. Norma's watching. Hi, Norma. Barbara's watching. Hi, Barbara. Um, yeah, so we did that yesterday. The day before that, we had a really fun show on showing sea glass, cultured sea glass. Uh, it's a matte finish glass uh, bead show. We also showed mermaid glass and some uh, matte finish opaque glass on Monday. So if you missed that, we still have oodles of that left over. So um, definitely get that. Um, if you're interested, uh, the prompt for um, the sea glass and the mermaid glass comes at the end of the month. And I'm thinking about doing a couple different projects um, sprinkled throughout so that people can kind of, even if people aren't doing summer of fantasy, they can still kind of get their beachy coastal vibe um, pieces made, maybe a little bit inspiration. Um, at one point, I made uh, we had a sale of it in a trunk show of uh, it in the shop. And for my kind of demo piece, because I always like to make a piece that shows us working with whatever we're trying to sell. Um, and so I made a mobile out of it and I took some uh, driftwood and uh, some hemp twine and made these kind of super beachy um, mobiles. And I still have them. Um, people kept asking to buy them and I was like, no, I don't wanna sell these because I like them too much. And then I also made some faux coral branches 
um, out of polymer clay and wire and resin um, and use those in the uh, mobiles as well. So I might, maybe one of these days, I might do a tutorial on how to do that if people are interested. Um, I think there are some kind of cool techniques that you can uh, impart. Um, one of the things I wanted to do is when I lived in New York, there was this really cool store and they had this whole like uh, candle, not candelabra, chandelier uh, made of um, all these coral branches. And the coral branches were actually made of glass. And so the way that it kind of lit up, it, it kind of had this Dale Chihuly meets Victorian cabinet of curiosity vibe. And I just loved it. And I was like, I love that. And then it was like $35,000. And I was like, I love that. But that is like the whole money that I make in a year. So, um, so yeah, no. Um, so it's like, oh, so that kind of, you know, sometimes things get lodged in your brain. And, um, you know, you kind of think about those things. And eventually, you know, they help inspire the work that you make. So I uh, made these kind of cool, funky coral branches out of polymer clay because I could afford the $1.95 for the pack of polymer clay. Um, and it's probably more nowadays. Um, and then I made the coral branches, coral branches out of that and then um, used those in my mobile designs with a cultured sea glass. So um yeah people are interested in that i can show them in theory i would take you well whenever we get to that i might just take you on a field trip into the spare room because it's hanging over the bed i wonder what people like it kind of um is probably not the best thing to do because i we would take the kittens in there to play and i can see them looking at it and i i can just one of these days, I feel like they're gonna they're gonna attack. They're gonna pounce on it. Anyways, so and then on Saturday, if you missed it, we had a another tutorial by Jen of JNT Creation. She's our in-house teacher or one of our in-house teachers who is um, who showed some spirals. Um, if you are interested in kind of joining the AG family where we we haven't really talked too too much about this publicly because we're we kind of keep the cards close to our chest but we're eventually going to start asking um and uh having more people film tutorials uh with us and collaborating with us and um yeah so hopefully if uh that works out and people are interested we can kind of collaborate and work together, whether that's kind of supplying the products or whatever, um, or teaching a class or, you know, we've been talking about ways that we can grow our content through our YouTube channel, mostly specifically our YouTube channel. Um, and, uh, you know, not put too much more pressure on me and William. So um, we're slowly gonna start asking more people to do that and contribute that way. So if you're interested in that, maybe, uh, maybe we can do something, you know, that would be nice. I like that. Um, and even if you're not local, if we plan it out right, um, it could work, you know, we can still make it work. So tomorrow I have a class in the morning on um, enameling steel and I'm super excited. And then on Friday, I'm driving out to Baltimore and, um, and getting, uh, taking a class with Eric Burris at the Baltimore Jewelry Center. I won a scholarship there and um, to take the class. I also won a one month bench position there. Um, but unfortunately, I had to turn that down because um, I, I can't leave for a month right now. So I was a little bit sad about that. But, um, you know, you have to kind of do.
do the things you can do. And um, I hope whoever gets that position, because I said, pass that on to somebody else who can do it. Um, and I hope they enjoy it because um, I would have really liked that. It's a, it's one of those things where when I was at Contemporary Craft um, and was an artist in residence there, I didn't really get a chance to interact as much with people. And I think that's partly because um, it was coming down from, uh, you know, the pandemic. And so we people were still masked up and still, um, uh, you know, doing that. And... Um, and still kind of social distancing. And then the gas prices were super high. So I think that kind of curbed a lot of the foot traffic that was that they normally have. Um, and so sometimes I would be there and I wouldn't see anybody all day. And it was kind of good because it allowed me to get some stuff done. But at the same time, I didn't really get a chance to interact with people as much as I would have liked. Um, and I don't know, I kind of want to be able to do that a little bit more. And so when we open the new store, I can't really imagine that it's going to be like popping right away. And that's just because of the area. Um, you know, it's not necessarily something that is, they don't have current, it's not currently, um, like there's a there's a few little shops around there where the other store is, but it's not like a mecca of like of of shopping yet. Like in Ligonier here, there's more of like foot traffic for that. Um, but anyway, so I was thinking about when we set up our benches there, I can kind of um, work on things throughout the day, and people can come in and talk. Um, we're only going to have limited hours to begin. Um, and scheduled classes and by appointment. So we're still gearing up for that. And so um, I'm super excited about the new store, but it's a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of work that we have to do before that opens up. So we'll see. But anyway, so the long, that was a long way of saying that um, I, I kind of want to have more interaction with people sometimes when I'm making it. I don't know. I say that now, but then who knows? When, after a while, I might be like, I want to be by myself. So who knows? We'll see. All right. So hopefully you all are doing well and staying creative this week. Um, if you have been making anything or doing anything, let us know. We always like to hear what you're working on. Um, in the beginning of our videos, I always do this little talk talk. And sometimes it seems like I'm just like rambling and kind of I am. But it allows people to kind of trickle in a little bit more. I need to have William show me how to do the um, set up the lives because I feel like like preset them up because I feel like he gets more viewers by scheduling them in advance. So, and having them like open, uh, open up before. So we'll see. I don't know. I have to, there, there's a lot of stuff that I'm still learning. Um, William, he does most of the technology and I kind of rely on him to do those things. And then I'm like, oh, then when it's my turn, then I'm like, I don't know how to do that. So we'll see about that. All right. So, yeah. So I talked about um, the tutorials on Saturday and how we're kind of planning on that. I've got a couple of friends in town that I'm going to ask to maybe do some some tutorials with us and some mixed media stuff. So we'll see how that goes. And um, yeah. All right. So who's ready for the tutorial before y'all be like, um, land the plane, Andrew, land the plane. I'm going to flip the camera around and um, then you can see uh, my messy workstation and then we'll get to it. All right. Oh, I probably should say, and then look, one more thing. Oh, oh, um, is if you haven't seen the summer fantasy calendar is currently live and there's a prompt every day in July. Um, you do not have to do them every day. And some people are like, I can't do it every day. 
And that's completely fine. If you can't do it every day, that's, you know, I have a hard time keeping up with it. Um, and I kind of, I help make it. So, um, you know, it, you, if you can, if you want, you can dip in and out. Um, you can also revisit stuff. Or if you know you're going to be busy and say, I mean, I know I'm going to be away for my sister cousin's wedding, then um, you can you can do things in advance too. So it's not we we don't have a lot of hard and fast rules about how you can participate um, in the uh, allegory gallery design challenge group. Um, there's a couple rules, you know, no spamming. And uh, we are trying to create and foster a positive environment. So no trash talking and, um, you know, be nice to everybody or be quiet <laughs> um, and, uh, and be supportive. I think that that's one of those things. I think one of the things about these challenges, which I think is one of the kind of perks of doing them, is the relationships that you build with other people while you're doing them. So of course, it's a wonderful exercise to push your own creativity and maybe get outside of your comfort zone. If you're, you know, if you're stuck um, creatively and have like a writer's block, what do they call that for somebody who's like a jewelry maker, a beater's block? Um, if you've got a beater's block or a writer's block or whatever, um, it's also a good way to step outside of your normal kind of everyday thing, thinking and try something new and push yourself and try to like, it helps. I know it helps me uh, get out of the funk whenever I kind of slow down. So these challenges are a wonderful exercise. I can't talk enough about them. And the thing is, is it sounds kind of weird for me to be saying stuff like that because I'm helping make this, but I really do. Uh, believe in the power of this. When we first started the store, um, there was a shop that was um, open in Seattle called Fusion Beads. I don't know if you all still remember them, um, but they used to do a similar kind of thing in the month of March where they had a list of calendars and I said, hey, Kitty Walk, can I do, can we do our own version at a different time? And they said, sure, go on ahead. Um, and so that's kind of the, I, where our idea of doing the monthly prompt came about. And, um, you know, they're no longer in business, but uh, I'm still friendly with everybody who used to work there. And I miss them. And I think it kind of pays tribute to, you know, it's like a passing of the torch in a way. But I used to participate as a blog blocker back in the day before we had the store many, many years ago. That's where I kind of, um, you know, I used to do them as well. So um, I, I, I know the importance and value of these creative challenges because I've benefited directly from them. So if people, you know, sometimes it seems hard or daunting or, um, you know, it seems too difficult or whatever, you know, there is a benefit from it. Um, oh, Carla's watching. Hey, Carla. She says, hey, Andrea, I've not got to watch in a while. Good to see you. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you got to join in today. All right, so um, today's prompt in the summer of fantasy is to create a piece with feathers. And I was like, what am I going to do? And so I had some ideas about showing how to make some cab cabochons or beads out polymer clay with feathers. And um, I was like, well, maybe what if I'll, I'll do like a shibori technique and I can show them that. And then I was like, we don't sell shibori stuff. So anyways, um. I thought uh, that we would do a sea beaded feather since I'm at home and I have sea beads and um, that's what I've got to work with. So I'm going to show you all how to do a sea beaded feather project. All right. So I'm going to flip this around and you're going to see the ceiling for a little bit and then we'll get to it. All right.
You can probably um, hear the kittens in the background. They're like, let me out. I want to play, 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 play. Um, Carlos, I used to follow your blog and was a member of the Creative Blog Reboot Group. Um, uh, Laura Lee invited me. Uh, oh, good. You know, um, we set out to do that and then it just never took off, I think. And it's so weird because we go to a lot of like small business things and um, they keep talking about how blogs are so important and you know even though i haven't blogged myself for many probably years at this point um i still get people who look at my blog from back in you know 20 i don't know if it's 20 years ago it's probably close if it's not 20 years ago it's close to 20 years ago when i started blogging um but people um, still message me about things I used to post about. So it's pretty wild um, to think that people are reading posts about like what I had for dinner back in 2016 um, or 2010 or whenever. I, I don't know when, when did I start it? I don't know. But anyway, so, and then that was actually the first iteration of the blog. The first iteration of the blog um, was on a platform that no longer exists. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I think I've been blogging most of my life and it's hard to think about that. But anyways, we go to the CEO, our SEO classes, and they they talk about how blogs are still important and how people still use them. And um, it's a great way to get what are called backlinks. And um, uh, we went to this... Uh, this class that was hosted by Facebook. And so they did this thing where they would check your backlinks and they are like, um, we volunteered and uh, the guy, he showed his website and he was like, um, oh, well this is, um, I have above average, I have about like 600 backlinks to my website and um, the average person will get like uh, 90. And then so he did, he, he called for our, um, volunteers. And so I did my blog and um, I submitted my blog for a review and he went and he did it. And he was like, oh, you have, and he, his eyes bugged out and he's like 90,000 backlinks. And um, I was like, what? And he was like, um, yeah, this is, yeah. Uh, wild. And he's like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, why are you taking this class? You don't need this class. Um, but that was a different time, you know, that was before Facebook, really. And it was before Instagram and threads and TikTok and Snapchat and every other chat. And so it was a different time. And it's actually the origin of how we kind of got, um, how we picked up steam in the bead world and that's how we kind of, um, you know, established ourselves in the beginning. And the store kind of naturally grew out of that as a progression. So anyways, is it a throwback Thursday? No, that's tomorrow. Um, all right. Um, yeah, we tried to do that creative reboot and it just never took off. But who knows? I think maybe... I kind of want to be one of those people who's going to do like, oh, I'm going to do that. And then I'm like, I, I honestly don't have time for that. So um, I don't know, maybe if enough people are interested in it. Um, we used to, uh, you know, I haven't actually talked to Lorelai in a long time. So I don't know, maybe she doesn't like me anymore. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's a different world, y'all. It used to be, uh, I talk to some people every day. Now I don't talk to hardly anybody anymore. Um, anyways, except for y'all. Uh, I mean, so I will catch the rest later. Please take care of everyone. See you next time. Okay, so I saw the feather prompt and got out some turkey feathers to make into earrings with beads. Oh, good. Here he says, I have a blog, mostly tutorials from my handmade jewelry and ceramics. It's been a while since I added anything new. Yeah, I think that's a common thing. Like there's so many other things going on nowadays that um, it's hard 
to post things like I used to, I posted every single day and um, we used to get like, you know, um, dozens of comments on my posts. And then eventually it just ground to a halt. And it was like two people looking at the site um, and there were hardly any interactions. So it's kind of one of those things where it's hard to feel good about devoting time to doing that when um, there isn't a lot of engagement, at least not right off the bat. And so anyways, I know it's important still, but we, we, and we still update our store blog with the things that were going on. And I guess the Patreon is kind of like a blog. It feels very much like a blog. Um, but anyways, I digress. Um, Carlos said, just checked my blog. My last post was February 13th, 2023. Not bad. My granddaughter was making her own Valentine's. Oh, that's fun. Cindy said, sorry, I'll have to watch replay later. Have company come in to visit soon. Well, I hope you have fun with your company. And Teresa's watching. Hey, Teresa. All right, so let's get to it. Before I start going off and talking about the olden times, the blogs, I was talking with one of these kids that came in the store and they're like, oh my gosh, that's my grandma has a blog. And I was like, I'm probably like, almost as old as your grandma. <laughs> Anyways, um, so here is the earring that we made yesterday during our live. Um, it doesn't really look like a wing. I probably could have added another kind of side piece here to make it look a little bit more wing-like. I think that would have given it a little bit more of a wing-like thing. Right now, it kind of looks more like a dream catcher to me but i was gonna do the sequins on this and make like a spiral of sequins and then i was like i don't like these sequins so i did not do that um i might show that technique um if i go to the cottage and dig through my sequin stash um because i have a lot more sequins hidden and i love them so um and then there is a sequin prompt at some point in the month um, so anyways, I took all that off. And then what I did was, um, so I showed how to do that kind of faux pico stitch edging on the side. And what I did to jazz that up and make it a little bit more interesting is I went back through and then I don't know if you can see it. Can you, so I took and did, um, I did like a peyote stitch on top of the pico stitch um, with size 15. So it gives it a little bit, I think it pulls some of the color of the, excuse me, the gold metal beads up around here. And so I kind of like that, but it also makes it look more like um, a dream catcher. So I don't know. Um, Carla says, I got hacked. Some Russian person was trying to sell fake Rolex watches and Viagra. My friend Danny said he'd take two watches. That's funny. Um, yeah, that's not very fun. You know, there, it's a, one of those things where it's kind of stressful when that happens because people... One of my friends, Crystal Wick, she her website, she was actually on the news about this. Her website, um, I think she lapsed in like renewing her website domain and somebody snapped it up in between. So it wasn't even like a hacking thing or maybe she was hacked. I can't remember. It's been so long. But anyway, so they were selling porn on that website and redirecting it to all these porn sites. And then they said, um, we're not going to stop unless you pay us all this money. And if you pay us all this money, then we'll sell it back to you or give you back access to it. And um, she had to like get that Better Business Bureau involved and how to call like the, I don't know who all she ended up calling, but she was on the news about it. And so like, I think that's a common thing, you know, where people try to get money however they can get. And it's like, just imagine if you put all that energy you did in doing like bad stuff and you put that towards 
our creativity or something like that, how much better the world would be. But anyways, um, so this is what we made yesterday. I hope people liked it. I started the second one. Uh, I'll probably finish that up tonight. Um, Carlos, is, oh, that's worse than Viagra. Well, I don't know. You, you can, you know, it's a, it's a different world also. You know, used to be, um, well, I don't know. I'm not going to, y'all going to make me talk talk about stuff I'm not supposed to talk about. So I'm going to be quiet about that. Anyway, so this is what we made. Today we're going to make a feather pendant. And um, yeah, so where is, okay, I'm going to got some fire line, of course. I'm going to use the this. This is an eight pound fire line. It's a thermally bonded thread. I'm going to cut off a wing span. So one arm length and one torso wide. And um, then I'm going to thread my needle. Shelly says, I love the, this earring. Very pretty. Well, it's super easy. And I hope people will make it. Um, and I have some ideas to jazz it up and make it a little bit different. So we'll see. Tune in next time. If I get the time, I'll do it. Um, so I've got these, they're triangular beads, um, and I got these from, uh, my friend Leslie Pope at Twisted Sista Beads. Um, if you do get anything from her, let her know that we sent you, because we adore her. She's a really wonderful person, and I, I really like her. I met her on the show circuit, and, um, you know, we've been friends ever since, Hopefully I'll get to see her this weekend, but I don't know. I have to I have to talk to her. I try not to plan too many stops whenever I'm doing um, some traveling. I'm picking up a jeweler's bench for the new store um, after my class is over, and it's right around there. So I want to see people, but I also know that, um, you know, uh, I don't want to overextend my schedule. Otherwise, it's it gets frantic, and then I end up canceling stuff, and then it's not fun. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to thread up this needle and I'm going to pick up four of these um, triangular beads. They're a line bead. They're, an, I believe they're a, um, a topaz with a raspberry lining. Um, I could be wrong. And I'm going to pull this down until I get kind of to the end. There's about four inches, four or five inches at the end. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to make an overhand knot and make these into a little circle like this. And then I'm going to do another knot. I'm going to make sure that's nice and pulled tight. And then we'll do another knot. And then that way that doesn't come loose. Because if that comes loose, then the sad times. All right. So this is what we just made by stringing up these four beads. I've got this wherever my needle is. Like I said, the pliers that are not anywhere clear near are like a magnetic... The, the joint and the pliers are like magnetically drawn to the thread that I'm working with. I'm, I'm going to take my needle and pass it up through um, and pull the knot underneath the speed. So it's kind of hanging out on the side here. And then I went through this and I kind of pulled it. And then that way your knot isn't exposed and then you're not going to have problems where um, you know, the knot can come loose. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up three more of these triangular beads and I'm coming out through the top of this bead. So I'm going to go up through the bottom of this bead. Bonnie says, I tried to make a circle yesterday and I blew it. Well, if you have any problems, let me know and I can maybe troubleshoot. All right, and then I'm going to go through 
this speed and this speed. So um, that we're always ending on that kind of side, side step. All right, Julie's watching. Hey, Julie. All right, and then this is basically, it is right angle weave. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna make the core of our feather, our little Phoenix feather um, with right angle weave. And so I'm gonna do, depending on how big you want your feather, will also determine how many um, times you go through. I selected larger beads for this so that for one, you can see what I'm working on because it's sometimes harder, but you could do this with size 11 beads and you could do this with delicas or with roll calls. Um, so there's a lot of uh, potential and depending on the beads, like everything, uh, the, uh, it can change the look of your piece. So just keep that in mind. Um, because sometimes, uh, you know, we want to have our own, it's a really way, a good way to put your own stamp on something. And there are so many different kinds of beads now, um, shapes and colors and finishes and all kinds of stuff that you can really put your own kind of spin on these designs. I also think that one of the cool things about, you know, making a lot of stuff, um, and this is one of the things. So one of the questions I get asked often, especially for like magazines and stuff when they're doing interviews with designers is how do you come about your style, like your signature style? And, um, you know, that's a, a big question. And one of the answers to that big question is just make stuff um, and constantly make stuff. And what you kind of see after a while is that as you continue to make things, you start to see that's Barnaby in the background. I don't know what he's doing. He's singing to them kittens. Um, anyway, so as the more that you make, the more patterns kind of reveal themselves. So you start working with things like different shapes or colors or things thematic elements. And the more that you make, the more um, those things become apparent. And sometimes you don't even know until you know. Um, and that sounds kind of amorphous and vague, but um, like there, like one of the things that I've been working on in my own art practice and kind of what I make for like museums and stuff are um, I do things for, um, I've been working on some self-portrait pieces. And so, uh, that kind of came about unexpectedly. I was going to do this whole kind of fairy tale, urban fairy tale kind of, uh, series. And when I got to contemporary craft, I had this whole plan of doing that. I had two goals. I was going to make this urban fantasy kind of thing. And I was going to learn how to use a hydraulic press because uh, I didn't know how to use a hydraulic press. So I knew um, I was going to take advantage of the fact that they had a hydraulic press and um, uh, I was going to use that so that I could go into like um, the idea is that I'm going to have stuff. Um, I can then have things production made. So I don't have to like hand raise every single thing or sculpt everything. I can just use the machine and some dies. So anyway, so that was my goal. And then I got there and it just not would not come out. Um, I worked on some a few things and they kind of looked tortured and um, not the best. So I was kind of frustrated and I didn't know where I was going to go with uh, my residency. And so I started... Um, you know, thinking about things and about myself and my life and um, like why I make things. And I started making these self-portraits. And I realized that whenever I get kind of stuck, I go back to making self-portraits. 
And one of the things that I did in college, I did a whole series of self-portraits back in college. I was making these great big um, abstract um, kind of biomorphic. I was working with um, one of my professors at the time was a scientist and she was really interested in like grotesques and um, there was a lot of like um, interest and in, like surface treatments with paints and um, so a lot of those things were kind of like these juicy kind of weird alien kind of bubbly forms and and I liked it but then I kind of got to the point where I was kind of like over it and I was lucky enough to go to this exhibition by Ellsworth Kelly. Um, that's not to be confused with my mentor in college named Ellsworth Osby, um, but Ellsworth Kelly. And if you look up his work, most of his work is um, these great, big, very minimal geometric abstractions. And so, and there are these things that he works with, which are called vibrating colors, which sometimes when you put certain colors together, it creates um, um, it creates that kind of, kind of it kind of makes the colors buzz. Um, anyway, so I think this is we're getting pretty close to the good the end of this part. But anyway, so um, anyways, I went to a show, and I think it was at Mark Kelly Gallery. I could be wrong. I need to look it up. But he, they showed his self-portraits. And all through his entire life, he would make a self-portrait kind of based off of the style that was popular at the moment. And um, you can see his whole progression of his life from when he was a young art student to um, an older man. And he was um, in the hospital in one of his self-portraits. And so, yeah, so anyways, um, I, I was really moved, like beforehand, I had not really gotten into his work. It was kind of a little bit too hard edge for me. And I was like, this is not for me. Um, I mean, they're impressive and I think they're cool and I understand their art historical value, but um, it seemed a little bit cold and impersonal to me. So it was not necessarily my jam. And so, you know, I did not necessarily resonate with his work, but his self-portraits, I definitely did because it showed a slice of what he was thinking and some of them had journal entries in them. And there was just such a beautiful kind of documentation of a life and, you know, just trying to see, you know, being in the moment and being present and understanding you know, that art is not necessarily a fixed thing. It's something that grows and evolves and changes. And even if it's, and it, even if it's not something that is uh, done for like commercial commodification, it is something that we can be used to learn as a tool. So anyways, uh, I started making some self-portraits and um, uh, I, I, I don't know, every once in a while uh, throughout my career as an artist, I go back to it. Um, so there are things like that, which you don't necessarily understand while you're doing them. But then after you think about it, and you have ch a chance to kind of think about what you're doing, you have a better understanding of yourself and your own practice. Uh, I see a couple of people, uh, Bonnie says, I what I like about seed beads is they are less expensive and very colorful. Yeah, you could do a lot of stuff with them. And even, you know, um, even if you don't use color, there's people who do a lot of stuff with blacks and grays and whites. But like you said, there's a bunch of different finishes. And I think it's one of those things where it's a very accessible entry point into beading. Mine says, what I hate about sea being is I poke myself all the time. Uh, if you get a chance, go ahead and get um, uh, a thimble. That, you know, sometimes we forget about those things. Um, if you don't want to use a metal thimble, there's a product that they sell. I think it's on Pepe Tools or Auto Fry. And they come from Japan and they're used for polishing 
but they are leather slash suede finger uh, covers. So they kind of look like little orange condoms for your fingers, and um, they will help it if you poke yourself a lot. Um, you're not going to get the blood time. At least not as much, unless you like really dig in there. All right, so I've... I've beaded this section of my feather. This is going to make up the ridge the, that the feather part, like the fluffy parts come off of. This is the core. I don't know what that's called. Uh, I probably should have looked that up before I did this. What I'm going to do, though, before I go any further, is I'm going to pull this tension pretty taut. I'm going to go take my needle and pass it under this thread bridge and do a half-inch knot. I call it an anchor knot. And that's just going to um, help hold the tension in place. I'm going to kind of pull tight, get that in there really nice, so that my piece, um, as I work through it, I'm going to go through this end. I'm going to go back around this last kind of nodule of right angle weave and um, really tie this in tight. And the reason why is that um, this is kind it kind of is the acts as a stop bead for the rest of the work. So it may seem weird that I'm going through. These holes on these beads are very ample. So you don't have to worry about things coming loose uh, or filling up. Well, sometimes when I work with smaller seed beads, like size 15s and stuff, um, you can have, you get, Sometimes I get worried about that. The quill or shaft. Yeah. So um, Cheryl says, I gave your friend Leslie a follow on her bead pages. She has beautiful beadwork. Oh, Leslie Pope. Yeah, I love her. She's awesome. Um, all right. So I've got this. I'm going to, I made my half his knot. I'm going to go back around and I'm going to come out through this side bead. And what I'm going to do now, once I come out the side bead, here's where the feathering starts happening. It's basically fringe. So if you like Bohemia time, Bohemian flair, tier designs, this might be for you. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up. Now, this is another opportunity for design element. So we're going to do a fringe coming off of all these sides. but it's up to you, like you have your core here. We did our right angle weave. And then, so we did our thread, made the spine or quill, uh, thanks Marianne, of uh, making this, and that's what this is. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna come off the side here and add some size eight seed beads. And then, um, then we'll finish it off with another bead. I haven't decided if I wanna do a size 11 or if I wanna put some crystal in there or do a drop, it's up to you. Um, those little details can kind of change the look of the design. And I think I might do these drops. I have some drops left over from yesterday. Um, cause I only use like two, I only use one, two, three, four, five. I only use five of those. So I have these drops left over. So I might incorporate those in that. And I like the way that finishes off the end of a fringe, but what here's where you have choices. So you can, um, add a lot and then it kind of looks, you know, it has a look that looks like, oops. It has a look that's more triangular, or you can start off gently and then build out and come back in. And it just depends on how you want to do your fringe. So it will determine the shape. So if you start off long and then taper down, you'll have more of a like a geometric, almost leaf-like shape. And if you do this, you start off 
smaller and then graduate up and then kind of keep it that same size length the same length and then start tapering down to the end then you can kind of shape it like a feather so de depending on how you do this it can change the look so if you want to have something that looks more leaf-like or more um more like a triangular feather you could definitely do that and it's really up to you also i'm going to use one color for my fringe uh, but if you variegate your thing or doing like an ombre if you do like all darks closer and then you kind of graduate out to a lighter color and then do a really light color that can look really interesting too um and you can actually take a real feather and look at a real feather and you can like make patterns and it's a really cool opportunity um to do that um that does take a little bit more figuring and if there is something like a design that you're trying to do what i would recommend is counting your beads in your spine um, and mapping it out and then uh making yourself a diagram so that way if you are going to do something with a pattern um and you have a very specific pattern in mind that way you don't lose your mind trying to figure out how to do that all right because sometimes when you're just like free free falling and free flowing um it can get overwhelming and you're like oh no but if you kind of plan this out you can plot out if you're going to do like an ombre or if you're going to do like um a pattern you know you can do every other one that's an easy pattern to remember but then eventually you know sometimes when you're doing like oh well i have to do three here one this color then three this one and then the next run i have to do two here three here and then two here it gets real confusing real fast i don't know about y'all but um, like if I'm like in the in the zone, and this is happens very rarely, y'all. When it when when I'm talking about um, when I get in the zone and I start pattern making, I can look at a certain uh, shape or design motif, and I can replicate it in the beadwork, and it can f kind of flow into there most of the time i have to graph stuff out beforehand um, and that helps me to understand how things are going to go now i also have to caution that just because you graph it out a certain way does not necessarily mean it will translate that way when it comes to your finished beadwork and part of that is because of the size and shapes of different beads will affect your design so I did this whole kind of Nordic inspired thing where there's this beautiful like red stitching that they do for some of their, their woolen things. And so I saw that and I loved it. And I think it was like on a scarf on somebody who's wearing it in the Olympics, I don't know, 15 years ago. I don't know when the last time that was, but um, there was this beautiful, almost like snowflake pattern which was very much, I don't know how to describe it. It was kind of like, I'm just, I don't know. But anyway, so it was kind of like that, which that's actually not a great rune or whatever. But anyway, so um, so what I was doing was, was using these small delicas to replicate this pattern. And what I was realizing is that when I had grafted out, I had grafted out um, so that everything was like on a grid. And it was like, almost like bingo. And um, everything was evenly spaced out in these grids. But the delicas I was using in this kind of peyote stitch were thinner and going sideways. So it took this design and it compressed it and it made it squished, which kind of looked cool, but it was not what I had envisioned. So sometimes you just have to work up a sample. This this feather pendant is relatively quick when you actually start working instead of talking about it. And um, so anyway, so uh, it goes up pretty quick. So if you are like, oh, I don't know, I don't want to waste all this time. 
it's a good way to do that. All right. So that's some of the idea behind this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up. I'm going to get this mess back over here. I'm going to pick up five of these um, size eight. They're kind of like a metallic anti-copper luster. And then I'm going to pick up maybe I don't know, one of these metal beads. Let me see if I have more of those. I do have more of those. I might do this copper. I might do this copper. I like this copper color. I know I should have planned this out beforehand, but I was kind of deciding because I was thinking about adding crystals to the end. And then I was like, nah, I'm going to. Um, not do that. Now, the thing about adding crystals is sometimes it's really beautiful and super shiny, but sometimes the ends of crystals are sharp and they can cut your threads. So um, I know a lot of designers who do not use crystals because of that. All right, so I'm going to pick up one of these copper beads and then I'm going to go back up through the eight or the one, two, three, four, five the five that I just added. I When I'm working with fringe, I tend to, um, to work flat mostly so that the gravity, um, you're not fighting gravity. It also, if you're gonna do work flat, it helps have a clean surface to work on because sometimes uh, if you have like a chaotic situation going on, then it can kind of look bad. So right now, I don't know if you can see this or not, but this thread is coming off on the side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna twist this bead, this copper bead until it lays uh, perpendicular to the ones that I just added. All right, so if your beads are like this, then you're gonna want your copper bead to be like this. And I, I mean, it's a small thing. If it doesn't, if it doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world. But it does have a nice finishing look. Oh, I was gonna use those drops. Anyways, I'll just use the copper beads. Um, it kind of goes better anyway. Um, so when I get to this, after I've added this first segment, then I'm going to go back up through this seed bead. And then I'm going to go down through this side seed bead right here. And then I'm going to repeat the step. So five of these size eights. One, two, three, four, five. I'm going to put this flat and I'm going to walk those down. And then I'm going to take one of these copper beads and then go back up through the five that I just added. And again, I'm gonna keep this flat-ish so that I don't end up kind of getting in my own way. And then I'm gonna adjust that bead real quick so that it's kind of not hanging out weird. And then I'm gonna go and work my, my needle over to the second um, segment uh, or unit of um, my beadwork. So I'm gonna just follow the thread going, since I came out of this bead here, I'm gonna go into this bead And then I'm going to come down through the speed. And what this also does is it reinforces your beadwork. 
because right now so it's kind of loosey goosey style and wavy gravy and i want this to be nice and sturdy i don't want this to fall apart and then the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to come down to the side bead and if i wanted to i can add a um a fringe if i want a tighter fringe i can add it here as well so i'm going to do that and um i'm going to add um one two three four five and then pick up a copper bead i'm going to lay this flat and then i'm going to go back up through just those um size eight and through this and pull it and then i'm going to add one and I went through that side bead there, two, or the bottom bead rather, three, four, and five. And then pick up a copper bead. And then I'm gonna flip this around so it's a little bit easier to get into. And then I'm gonna go back up through those five beads. Pull it taut. And then I'm going to go down through this next bead right here. All right. And then I think I'm going to add six of these size eight beads. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this is at this time where I, you know, I kind of sometimes I have a love-hate relationship with those sped up videos. But this is one of those things where this is really helpful uh, to have the sped up so you don't have to see every gory detail. And so I added six and then I'm going to work my thread back around my unit so I can get to the other side. I don't want to get to the point where I'm not, um, you know, it's super helpful just to follow your thread paths. Um, and what that does, if you have to change the direction, you can always put like a half hitch knot or what I call the anchor knot and um, do that. But, um, you know, one thing I will say about CB is it takes more time. So like I had this idea of doing like this polymer clay thing and that I could have busted out in like 10 minutes. And this is something that's gonna take like an hour to do, especially if you're okay, two, four, five, six. So it's not as quick of a process. I Me, mean, the more you do of them, the faster you get. And also, um, if I'm not telling people instructions on how to do it, it goes quicker. Um, but once you get it down, it's pretty easy. So all you have to do is you're adding a fringe um, with your beadwork. So you made that right angle weave spine, and then you add a fringe off of that right angle weave. So what I'm going to do, and one of the things that's super important for this design to look right is to keep the tension tight. So normally I say, you know, kind of keep it in the middle, but with the fringe, you want the fringe to be tight because you want it to stick out and um, you want it to be stiff. You don't want that to be loose. You want it to be a little bit stiffer on the stiff side. So that way... Um, it sticks out like a feather. All right. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because I'm not really going to do anything new. All I have to do is do this uh, um, more of this feather fringe that I'm making. I might finish this off off camera. Now, I haven't showed a lot of finishing, how to finish off a lot of projects. 
And that is my fault for not showing that. I kind of just assume that people can make a beaded loop. And I probably should not assume that. But to do, to finish off a lot of these designs, you can take and make this loop. And wherever you come out, you can make a little beaded loop. I'm using a smaller bead to do this loop. So if I wanted to have a loop here at the top, I don't want to use these beads because that loop would be like great big. Now, if you want to have a great big, um, big loop as like a design element, you know, go for it. But if you don't want to do that, um, you can also um, then don't do that. Um, and the way that you can get around that is by making using smaller beads like this is size 11 and you can make a size 11 loop or one of the things that i kind of do sometimes is i incorporate jump rings and if you have a thin enough jump ring you can use this now i if i'm going to do this i don't want this to come apart so i will take a block of wood or a piece of wood and I take my rubber mallet or nylon hammer and gently tap this and work hard in it. Um, when you have thinner gauge metal for jump rings, they easily can come apart if just the slightest amount of pressure is put. So if you're using a kneeled metal or a soft metal, like a base metal wire, um, it can come apart really easy. So I tend to use like a copper um, that I know I can work hard on, or a sterling silver or even steel. If you have steel jump rings, those are super sturdy and you can get stainless steel jump rings and different things. Um, even brass is a, a sturdy jump ring. But if you have like those aluminum ones and they're thin, they just come apart, in my opinion. Those are not really designed for this kind of application. They're designed more for like a chain mail where a lot of links are put together and that kind of interlocking of links gives it strength, um, not necessarily the individual link. It's that weakest link business talk. All right, and so what I do is I open these up I hold one side stationary and I hold the eyes pivot and these have ample holes. So then I just slide this in and then I close it up. Now you have to be careful not to crunch your, your beading in your, your glass beads and the pliers cause you can do that. And then it's the sadness. Um, and if you have the ability to soft solder, um, you can solder that link or that join right there and it will never come apart. I mean, it could if you like cut it, but that's a way that you can have a finishing touch on that. Now, if you don't want this to move, you can also do um, some decorative wire wrapping around this link um and wherever there's that decorative wire wrapping it won't move um the the bead won't or the link won't move where there's that wrapping so if you want this to stay stationary and have a decorative element you can do that also now if you another design variation is i started right at the top here but if you don't like that look and you want it to look a little bit more feather-like, you can always start lower down and um, use that. Now, I use these great big beads, the, um, the triangular beads, the size six triangular beads. I think they're size six. They could be a little bit larger. Um, and um, that's so that I can slip this jump ring in. But if you use a different size seed bead, um, or a one that has a small hole, you know, you won't necessarily be able to slip your jump ring in. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know that as we design and develop these things, we kind of have to troubleshoot sometimes. 
And that's kind of where the fun comes in. Sometimes things work out. Sometimes things don't work out. And sometimes you kind of learn as you go. I've seen some really cool kind of ideas of how to um, incorporate uh, connections to beadwork. They have these things called pinch bail beads or uh, pinch bales. And they basically, I don't have anything right now. But a pinch bale, um, if this is your bale, it's shaped kind of like this. And there are these little pieces of metal and they um, come down like this. And here's your bale. And this is kind of a weird cross-section drawing. But then what you do is you squeeze both sides of this and these connect. And so if you have something in here, it can trap that there and have um, a metal connection for your end. So if you don't like putting um, a thing like that in there, then you can use a pinch bail. And that's a good way of doing that so that there's a nice uh, connection. But again, it's up to you about how you want your pieces to come together. Because sometimes we want our things to come become a certain way. And then you kind of have to figure out how you're going to get that to work. But that's a nice kind of finishing way of doing like the, the end there if you don't want to put just a jump ring in. I think the jump ring in my mind is a little bit more secure because um, pinch bales, um, I mean, this is not something that you're going to roller derby with anyways or roll on the concrete. So um, for this more, it's a more delicate connection. Um, but once it's together, I don't know, it's pretty sturdy. I know some people will put glue. I don't really like that necessarily because it can kind of, cr like if you're using like a Loctite glue, it can kind of get crusty and um, and it feels kind of weird on it. So I would not necessarily recommend that. But, um, and so it's up to you. You can do a beaded loop if you want. You could also do a beading wire through it too. You could probably do this design with beading wire like flexible beading wire if you wanted, but um, the way that you put things together might be different. I would have to think about that. Like this part would be no problem. The right angle weave would be no problem. But then I think you would have to do a separate, you'd have to uh, bind that off with um, a crimp bead and then go back through with a finer gauge uh, flexible beading wire. But anyways, I'm gonna finish this off, off camera. I'm gonna play around with this. So I started with five and then six. And then, so I'm gonna probably go up maybe to like a nine, nine length and then taper it back down and then end here. So I'll finish off. And then when you finish the whole, um, when you finish the end, you can either um, do that where the, it comes off the end here like that, or you can come down and add stuff at the bottom, but um, it's a little bit, um, I don't know. You have to kind of think about how you want to finish that off. I'll show you how I finish mine off and then uh, off camera. And then if you have questions, uh, I'm probably going to be back tomorrow. Um, William has another class, uh, so I'll be back. But anyways, I hope you all enjoy these seed bead tutorials. I know that I'm not really known for seed beading. I dabble with it, and a lot of the stuff I do is kind of like, I don't want to say it's secretive, but I don't necessarily, I'm not like Marcia DeCosta, who is known for seed beading or uh, Kinga, who's known for seed beading. I'm uh, mostly known for stringing and now more of my metal work and mixed media work. So, and, you know, I think it's good to have different facets and do different things. And like I've been telling is uh, throughout this, doing these seed beaded projects is it's very portable. 
And so you can do, you can have hours of fun and entertainment and only take up like a Tupperware size worth of um, space. So that's pretty good. All right, so I'm going to finish this off camera. All it is is adding fringe off the side of this right angle weave core. Um, if you do, if you need another example of right angle weave, I showed how to do right angle weave when we did that beaded bezel. Um, I showed how to do right angle weave with making a uh, bracelet with a soda light. Um, and so all you're doing is just adding your first four and then you add three every so often so that you get, you have these like cardinal directions of uh, beads in a little circle. All right. Hope you have a great evening and I will talk to you all tomorrow. See you.